make sure to do that. And did you all get a recording now? Yes. It's all yours. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chloe Woods, and I am the chair-elect of the National Bar Association Young Lawyers Division. Today's webinar is entitled Election 2020, Public Health Law and Policy Impacts. Please note that the webinar is general in nature, and you should always check your applicable state and local laws. This webinar is brought to you by the Network for Public Health Law and the Center for Public Health Law and Policy, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University, in partnership with the National Bar Association Young Lawyers Division. So special thanks to current chair, Onika Williams, for bringing this important topic to bear for our members. For more information on public health and public health law updates, please visit the network's website at www.network4phl.org. Again, that web address is www.networkforphl.org. During the webinar, if you have any questions, you may submit them in the Q&A box which can be found using the menu bar on the top right side of your screen. You can ask questions at any time and we will answer them at the end. Thank you. And I'll turn it over now to our esteemed presenters and personal mentor of mine, Dr. Jane College. Well, Chloe, thank you so much. First of all, it's great to see you. And Anika, again, we're delighted to be able to bring you this fantastic material. And so today, what we'll try to do this evening for everyone's benefit is try to break down a little bit of what just happened in relation to election 2020. We've got a little bit more information now that we're actually a, a, almost a month removed from election day. And to that end, I'll be joined by my great colleague, Leela Barraza, who's associate professor at the Melanie Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona and a core colleague of mine with the Network for Public Health Law. We run the Western Region Office out west here. We're based in Phoenix, Arizona. And to that end, we do all of the emergency legal preparedness work, but also a lot of different types of topics and interests, any of which we can either address directly for anyone on this webinar, or we will get you in touch with folks within our network who can help on any specific interest in front of society. So what Lila and I are gonna to try to do is as follows. And we will be moving quickly to make sure we get to the best analysis we can with what we know in real time in response to a few critical objectives. First of all, let's talk about the post-election results. Let's take stock of how historic this election actually is. It's such a critical moment in US history. And so to that end, we'll be brief, right to the point. We'll then head right into our sort of assessment of the core public health issues, the current challenges that have really been you know, seen and experienced in the United States in the current administration and for years before in many ways. But what we might project that Leela and I would do our best job on possible to give you a sense of what are those law and policy responses to look forward to in a Biden-Harris administration. That's part of what we'll try to accomplish in regards to several critical topics, then taking questions and comments at the end to every degree possible, raise those questions as Chloe was mentioning in chat and we'll be monitoring for that and we'll be looking forward to addressing those in real time with Chloe's help. And without further ado, just remember, like with everything we do as attorneys, whatever you hear us talk about here, it's not legal advice, of course, nor is it intended to actually promote a specific legal or policy position. We're just here to communicate what we think to be some very aspiring in integral information in relation to election 2020. So this was big, in fact, huge. I think it's the biggest election we may all experience and remember held in the throes of a pandemic involving some minor change involving the first ever elected african-american vice president and female vice president in u.s history what an incredible election for all of us to take stock i would like to say that joe biden and kamala harris they you know kind of gave the boot to trump and pence but Seems like Joe's the one wearing the boot these days. I understand he got a little accident and he'll be hopefully fine. But the reality is, this was a very substantial shift in US policy in regards to our approaches to presidential politics going forward. Let's take stock of that. But let's also remember a couple other critical things looking back on this election, even just a few weeks removed. First of all, it's more than just what we saw in relation to the presidential shift. So we continue to keep at the moment a sort of very narrow but yet clear Democratic majority in the House of Representatives. That was not guaranteed, and it got close, but to be sure, it looks like Democrats hold the House. The U.S. Senate was up for grabs. You all know that, and it still is. 
Georgia's results are something we're going to have to look forward to later in the month of December, early January, and see if those two Senate candidates go both Democratic and Georgia. We've got an even split at that point with two independents largely voting democratically. That makes Vice President Kamala Harris the decider, as we know. That could be very interesting. But we need two Democrats from Georgia. If it were to split, Democrat conservative or Democrat Republican, well, obviously it will re retain Republican control. There was very substantial gubernatorial elections as well. 23 Democrats coming out victorious, 26 Republicans, one independent. And state legislatures had their own activity. Some flipped the House, some flipped the Senate. A little too hard to track for our purposes here, but just historic results in regards to this specific election. Here's what Leela and I pulled away from this election more than any other fact, and it'll drive the rest of this presentation. When Americans were asked in the Wall Street Journal poll, you're seeing the results of on screen right here. When they were asked post-election, hey, what were the factors that most influenced your vote? These are their responses. And just look at what they said. COVID-19, 40% of Americans saying, yeah, that was the biggest factor. That alone was the most substantial reason they voted one way or another. But then look at the other reasons on this pie chart. Healthcare, law enforcement, climate change, immigration, abortion, racism, all capturing America's attention, dominating and dictating their vote. Add it all up because as Leela and I see these, these are health, public health issues. 70% of these issues, other than the economy, our core public health healthcare issues, those are the ones that dictated the outcome of this election. This election was decided because of health, public health issues in so many different ways. And the analysis of that may go on for years to come, but the initial snapshot of what we're seeing, really quite critical. There are so many topics Leela and I could discuss with you all today. And we're looking forward to as many of these as we can get to, but the reality is we're gonna boil it down to eight core topics. Here's the ones we can't address directly not because they're unimportant, but because they may come in a little bit with some of the cores we've got, but issues related to social determinants of health and tobacco, vaccination concerns, mental health issues, telehealth, Medicare for all proposals. You saw Democrats introduce running up to this election, you know, illicit drugs, marijuana use, global health, all critical, all important. But for our purposes, Leela and I will hone in on these eight critical topics, giving you that sort of challenge versus legal response projected that we might start to see in a sort of post-January uh, status in regards to the presidential side of things. We'll take on COVID-19 pandemic response efforts very briefly. We will talk about this sort of theme of revitalizing public health services and what that will mean, we hope, for the 21st century to sort of turn the corner on, 20, on revitalization of public health. Gun violence prevention, always a critical public health and healthcare concern. Climate change, it's gonna be front and center. The Biden administration's made that perfectly clear. And then I'll turn over to Leva for Affordable Care Act repercussions, issues related to Medicaid, maternal and child health, including some issues in reproductive health and health equity and justice, so critical and so invaluable to discuss at all elements. Leela will cap our discussion with that and then we'll look forward to good questions and comments. So let me take on these four brief topics. Let's just assess what's possible because the challenges are immense. What's possible in each of these arenas? Well, let's be very clear in regards to our assessment of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been bad. It's been bad for months and it's getting worse. Every epidemiologist will tell you that. And post Thanksgiving trends are not looking good. You know, what you've seen from Biden and Harris is a sort of description of what we've got ahead of us is dark winter the sort of assessment of where we are with a pandemic that will not stop in relation to its impact on the United States, largely because of our national failure to do what so many other countries are doing so much better, mitigate the impacts of COVID infection. Look at the stats at the top of the page and just realize one, or top of the screen, and just realize one critical facet of what we're showing there. Our US cases now 13.6 million as of today. Our deaths, horrific, 268,000 plus deaths. There'll be another 1,500 to 2,000 more tomorrow. It's that bad, but here's the really telling stat. 21% of all cases globally, right here in the United States. 18% of all deaths right here in the United States from a pandemic in a country with 4% of the global population. That's a gross level of underperformance in mitigating a specific pandemic and its experience in the United States. 
what we're seeing is President or President elect Biden and Vice President elect Kamala Harris have a game plan. It's for real and it's going to include the following types of implementation issues. First of all, they are making promises and I think they'll back it up with the type of science that makes a difference to reinstitute best practices. What do we know work from a legal science and global commitment? What works? How well are they going to use it? How strictly can we enforce it? Expect more in relation to that, like a lot more, turning significant corners and pages in the Biden plan in regards to how we're going to respond to COVID-19 effective January 20th. There will be an enhanced aggressive federal response and coordination to allies and national security threats too. That's what this pandemic now represents. Even President Trump recognizes that. It's a national security threat. And the federal approach to how to address that can be profound, it can be significant, you're going to see some very interesting legal interventions are going to push the feds into the realm of where states traditionally would go on some of the response efforts. We're going to see, I think, increased funding. And that funding is going to be recommitted to the WHO, the World Health Organization, which President Trump is backed out of, and domestic public health interventions, notably including economic benefits, impacts that Americans across the board have been feeling, but with particular disparities among various persons, you know, vulnerable groups and other ethnicities, that have experienced COVID-19 because of the impacts on them. These are remediable, but we need true economic performance and incentives. Those are projected to be forthcoming too and crafting new alliances. You know, states are just up in arms. Whether you're out West here with us and you see a state with deep pockets like California, literally outbidding the federal government on things, or you're back East and you're watching Washington DC or Virginia or Maryland try to actually negotiate with states around them in those tri-county or tri-state initiatives, hey, this is time to craft new alliances, time to get states working again with the federal government. I'm expecting that on the front lines to make critical differences. These are the types of legal interventions that you'll see play out with everything from vaccine allocation to also the other fronts. And those different, those critical assessments will make critical differences. Look at this particular slide. Let me try to illustrate what this means for our purposes. When I talk about revitalizing public health services, the challenges are really significant. You know, we have substantial new threats, COVID's right there before us. We have substantial long-term chronic funding reductions. We have underfunded public health in the United States, not for this past year, not for the past decade, for the past three decades. Interjurisdictional battles have resulted between feds, states, locals, tribal governments, gross inequities, horrific inequities. The types of disparities in you know, impacts that you're seeing across so many different populations in the United States it's all led to lower life expectancies. I mean, as Americans, we actually live shorter lives now than people from 20 years ago and considerably shorter lives than people in other countries, often with considerably fewer resources. Here's the kicker to this slide. I could have generated this slide before COVID and it all still be true. That's how bad and how underfunded and how gross inequity we've seen in relation to the public health system in the United States. The Biden-Harris administration plans to address this in a lot of different critical ways. And I think the leadership at the national level will make a big difference. We're going to quell the pandemic, first of all, through legal innovations that actually work. They become models, not just for what we do in emergencies, but what we do day to day in routine health and public health delivery. That's going to make critical differences. Think about the telehealth movement you're seeing right now. Can that be a permanent feature to reach a lot more Americans? You bet it can, and I expect it to be. Reassessing the constitutional balance. Gosh, we've got a Supreme Court with a whole new membership and let's be sure we don't know what direction to project there. But what we can say is there will be a push to reconceptualize that balance, so essential. And it works still with the US Supreme Court, that balance between communal interests and individual rights and how we play that out in a public health environment, addressing specific threats to the public's health, threats that so many persons experience, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, illicit drug related use, all those specific issues. These are priorities for the Biden-Harris administration. And we can see new revised law and policy interventions consistent with that acronym HIAP, health and all policies approaches. I expect to see that a lot more from this administration. That's gonna be exciting to see how we actually wield government to accomplish things that we've not yet tried or sought to do so far. And then finally, commitment to reducing health disparities. So important. You've seen Vice President-elect Kamala Harris speak on this directly. Uh, President-elect Joe Biden sp spoken on this very closely and very directly. You've got to work to eliminate these disparities. These are the types of 
interventions through social determinants of health, if you intervene and relate to them through national leadership at the grassroots and other levels, critical differences can be made in your community and across states and at the federal level too. Gun violence prevention and challenges, so critical. I mean, honestly, you know the challenges here. We know how to prevent gun violence. It's Americans' belief we just can't do it though because of the Second Amendment. That belief is wrong, at least for the moment. But the Supreme Court does have a different constitution, and I, that I mean of its members, and to be sure, has the capacity to make crit critical key changes in response to gun violence prevention because of its future interpretations of the Second Amendment. Case out of Philadelphia right now may all but lend the court to lead in with a new series of directions for that. We shall see just how far that goes in that respect. But to be sure, this is what Biden and Harris have promised in relation to some of their campaign proposals. First of all, the assessment of how we can go about constitutionally banning what we used to ban, the manufacture and sale of assault weapons, and heavily, heavily regulating weapons already in circulation. We've done this in the United States. We did it constitutionally at the federal level. It expired, and Biden and Harris want to see it reinstituted, as well as ending online purchases of firearms and ammo. No more purchasing online it's products that you couldn't get even if you showed up at the gun store. That can be done effectively and constitutionally. We can incentivize states to actually enact their own laws. Let's say you can't push these things through the Senate. Federal government influence in relation to the uh, use of the purse, spending power and provisions, potentially to incentivize states. And then we've got to reach to some accord on one of the more pivotal facets of what you saw as the election results, empowering police to effectively enforce gun violence prevention laws and simultaneously reforming their own practices to limit the type of unwarranted acts of aggression and such that we've seen all summer long and obviously have a trail of history in the United States that goes far beyond what we can recount here. To be sure, that similar or that sort of dual objective, critical facet of what Biden Harrison promised in regards to the future. And then finally, climate change briefly here. I don't even have to tell you the public health threats of climate challenges. They're severe, they're profound, and you're experiencing them in the United States and globally right now. So what can the administration do? Literally reverse everything that the Trump administration has done. There will be a rejoining of the Paris Climate Agreement. That'll make a critical difference because states never left. California and other states always agreed to stick with that plan. And once the feds back it up again, you're gonna see continued movement towards that objective. What you've seen as well is a suggestion to decrease fossil fuel subsidies straight up to literally give little financial reason to the federal government to actually produce and use fossil fuels. There'll be assurance that the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Justice actually get back in the business of prosecuting pollution cases. I promise that you've seen from Vice President or from President-elect Biden, as well as considering climate change and federal permitting and infrastructure investment. Hey, these are the types of ideas that have been put on the scrap heap by the Trump administration, reinstituted, I think in the future, very soon and will make very critical differences we can only hope in the interest of the public self. Now, without further ado, let me turn it over to my great colleague, Leela Barraza, for her discussion of these four additional critical issues. Leela. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining and, and having us join um, this evening to talk about these core public health and policy issues. Um, as mentioned, I'm gonna take the last four and start with the Affordable Care Act. Next slide, please. Thank you. I'm sure all of you are aware of the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010. You know, a, a history of since 2010, a history of, um, uh, you know, attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act by Congress and legal challenges, multiple legal challenges brought to, you know, uh, to the Affordable Care Act. CARE Act in courts, and most recently, next slide please, most recently that culminating in California v. Texas. So while there have been multiple legal challenges around different aspects of the Affordable Care Act, the case California v. Texas, the most recent case heard, oral arguments were heard um, post-election November 10th, which seems like a long time ago at this point, was less than a month ago. Um, the oral arguments were um, heard that um, before the Supreme Court challenging whether um, now that 
There is no penalty for the individual for not purchasing insurance after um, Congress made that penalty zero. That the tax cut under the Tax um, Cut and Jobs Act. The challenge was now that that is zero. Now that there is no uh, a zeroed penalty. Does Congress have the authority, because it's no longer a tax then, does Congress have the authority to, um, to implement or to pass the Affordable Care Act? The next question before the court is, if the actual Affordable Care Act or the individual mandate is unconstitutional, is it severable? Is the rest of the Affordable Care Act still legal? Can it still be law in the United States? And there are so many provisions of the Affordable Care Act that people don't often think about, that pr protections for um, uh, breastfeeding moms, menu labeling, so many provisions that have nothing to do with the individual mandate. So the court has to decide, you know, whether, um, you know, what they're going, obviously, you know, what they're going to decide versus if it, if the, they have standing in this case is one component and or if it is unconstitutional, whether it is severable. Now, we don't know how the court will decide. Everyone will say, you know, don't judge the dis predict the decision just based off oral arguments. Um, but, you know, the hope is that the bulk of the affordable craft will stand if not all of it, um, but that the rest of the provisions such as Medicaid expansion, which I'm gonna get to in a second, but other big components of the Affordable Care Act that have a huge impact on access for people from health insurance. So one thing to know is what's gonna happen with that. We probably will know in 2021, but the Biden-Harris administration also has some other plans. So they plan to um, have a choice to purchase a public health insurance option they want to increase the tax credits to lower premiums. So the tax credits are part of the Affordable Care Act currently and provide um, premium subsidies to those purchasing insurance. So the Biden-Harris administration has um, voiced uh, support for increasing those tax credits so that individuals pay less for their premiums. And lastly, there's also support for restoring section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. Now this section is a non-discrimination section and was written in rules in 2016 under the Obama era. This is kind of a theme you'll hear in some of the next few slides that I'm presenting, um, but restoring Obama era regulations is, is kind of a theme of what we're gonna see in some of these public health um, policies uh, going forward under the Biden-Harris administration. So, in 2016, under Obama, there were um, clear uh, rule regulations with definitions for section 1557. And again, that's a non-discrimination section of the act that protects um, people from um, discrimination in health activities or programs. And in the Obama era 2016 regulations, there was a sex discrimination definition on the basis of sex. And that definition included gender identity. Now in um, 20, there were some legal challenges to those regulations. In 2020, Trump issued a final rule just this summer and the definitions of on the basis of sex and gender identity were removed from the final rule this summer. So the, um, that has also been a subject of litigation. So that has not been um, implemented yet, but the restoration of those non-discrimination um, sections and the protections for those in health programs and activities is something that um, President-elect Biden has expressed interest in, in doing with his administration. Next slide, please. Medicaid. So as I mentioned, the Affordable Care Act, you know, a thousand page act, we all know when we've read statutes that there might be multiple components of an act that you know, have varying implications. One big component of the Affordable Care Act is Med Medicaid expansion. It allowed a new category of individuals 
to be um, covered under Medicaid. And it was adults up to, and in, um, up to 138% of the federal poverty level. James, I'm seeing movement. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're all good, Leila. My apologies. Oh, so thank Sorry. You for yeah, go ahead. I thought you were trying to, to, to tell me that there was, I, I've been having internet challenges just like we all have had. <laughs> I'm always cognizant, you know, someone, you know, if someone can't hear me or. So please. true. No, no, it's just my cursor. My apologies. Go for it. No worries. No worries. So Medicaid expansion, these are the states that have um, adopted and implemented Medicaid expansion. Um, there's a few states that still in the United States that have not adopted Medicaid expansion to um, cover that um, additional population. Um, and there's some that have adopted but not implemented it yet. So we still have this Medicaid expansion, this coverage of new individuals. Now, what we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic is an increased need for Medicaid coverage because so many individuals have unfortunately lost their jobs and lost healthcare coverage um, through their employer. So more people have um, needed access to care through Medicaid. Next slide, please. So in this interest of coverage through Medicaid, a couple of the components that we've um, seen it discussed in a Biden-Harris administration is one reversing block grant, block grant funding proposals. And this was a proposal that uh, has been discussed in recent years under the Trump administration. And the real concern or fear about block grants is that when there's um, a block of funding given to the states, that states might limit eligibility for um, some low-income adults or limit their access to certain um, services or resources. So that has been um, a component of the Biden-Harris administration to uh, um, say they plan to reverse block grant funding proposals. Um, the Biden-Harris administration has also mentioned lowering Medicare eligibility to 60. So more individuals then would be um, shifted from Medicaid and rescinding work requirements. This is a, a recent thing um, under the Obama administration, work requirements were not approved. Under the Trump administration, there was a, a shift and there were states that had applied to require um, proof of employment, proof that you were seeking employment or um, proof of a certain exemption, for example, a student. Um, and a lot of that requires a lot of administration to have individuals to keep proving those um, eligibility requirements. And so some states have um, had work requirements approved. It has been subject to much litigation. Some states that have actually had um, work requirements approved have decided not to implement them because of the subject, because of the litigation in other states. But that has been um, a talk of rescinding work requirements for Medicaid eligibility or, or requirement that you would access or prove that those requirements to receive your Medicaid benefits. And then another aspect of Medicaid that's been discussed is expanding coverage for women to 12 months postpartum. What a lot of people um, may not recognize is that a lot of pregnancies in our country, a lot of pregnant women are covered under Medicaid when they're pregnant, if they don't have access to other health insurance and they meet um, income requirements. And while they might be covered during their pregnancy, they may not then be covered long-term postpartum. And that is a key component we know for keeping mothers and babies healthy. So expanding coverage for women to 12 months postpartum is another key component of the Biden-Harris administration related to, movement related to Medicaid. Next slide, please. Okay, maternal and child health. I, I kind of lead into this with the 12 months postpartum. Some of these topics really kind of flow together with some of these um, plans for the future related to public health. But the maternal and child health challenges are ones that we've seen. We've seen, you know, plans. Um, next slide, please. Plans for key components for keeping 
mothers and children safe in, in our country. You know, we're eliminating exemptions to coverage for contraception under the ACA. Under, again, as I mentioned, that theme of, you know, Obama era regulations being brought back. Under Obama, um, the regulations were requirements under the Affordable Care Act required um, individual or excuse me required insurance to cover contraception under the affordable care act under the obama era regulations churches or other similar religious institutions um, were exempt from these requirements trump expanded these exemptions to much broader expanded moral and religious exemptions and included a much broader um, group of, of employers to be exempt from requiring or providing the contraceptive coverage required under the Affordable Care Act. In July of this year, under Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court actually upheld the Trump rules. But the Biden-Harris administration has um, indicated that they plan to go back to the Obama era regulations that really um, provided accommodations for religious nonprofits and provided exemptions for churches or other similar religious institutions, but were not as broad as the Trump era regulations. Another um, component, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act has a lot of per, um, components for protecting um, women and those uh, in, Reauthorization is needed after it has expired and that President-elect Biden has voiced um, support for reauthorization. We're asking Congress to reauthorize and push that, push that forward. Um, support for paid family leave for both parents. That is a key component we know for families and children or families after they've had babies and keeping the babies. Um, safe and healthy as well. And so that's another um, Biden-Harris supporting paid family leave for both parents. Last but not least on this um, list, expanding and supporting childcare access. Biden-Harris administration has um, indicated they would like to expand childcare access, but also including in that universal preschool to give children access to preschool that and, and education early on, because you know early interventions are so important for children and giving them access to that and helping the parents by expanding and supporting childcare access. So key, key initiatives for um, mothers and children and family, children and families. Next slide, please. Okay, last but not least on this list, very important, health equity and justice. We know there have been many challenges in this area area in, in recent years. We know the political pendulum swings both ways. Senate may control the purse, which may take control actions taken in related to health equity and justice. And health equity we have seen, not just in this pandemic, but we have seen in recent years, the true inequities in health in our country and the pandemic has only highlighted really the truth and exacerbated um, the inequities existing. So we have underrepresented of effective groups and positions of political power, which can stifle growth and policies that promote health equity. And so that, those are all challenges that we've seen in recent years. Next slide, please. So what can be done? What may happen in the future? What are some of the responses that could be done in, in the new administration? First, installing appointees who represent vulnerable populations most in need of improved access. We've seen already many of the um, proposed appointees in the Biden-Harris administration. We have um, an, another key topic, providing a health insurance public option that focuses on reducing maternal mortality rates. I talked about um, some other aspects of maternal child health in the last few slides, but here again, as I mentioned, some of these really do overlap and interact together to um, in, in a kind of proposed policy plan. And in this one, we've had maternal mortality rates higher 
in our country than we really want to see that that our country you know should have currently and so biden president-elect biden has expressed concern for this and he wants to um, provide a health insurance public option that focuses really on redu and, and focusing his plan on reducing maternal mortality. So how would a public health insurance public option help? So individuals who don't have insurance through their employer, um, they can still get access to a public option that will provide adequate access and key um, components of health, you know, healthcare access for those individuals. Also doubling investment in community health centers. Our community health centers across the country work so hard to provide care for the most vulnerable populations in their communities, those that may have no other source of access to healthcare providers. Um, health, community health centers get federal funding and can provide care on a sliding fee scale. So really those that need care can get care. Um, so investing in those community health centers is a big key component of a, the Biden-Harris administration's plan. Um, also increasing the federal minimum wage to $15. And we're sending an executive order that was put into place recently by President Trump that bans implicit bias training, allowing um, individuals and employers and groups to discuss and train and make people aware of implicit biases. And that way we can, you know, through those trainings, address those biases and improve our responses to reduce them. And we know that those trainings can be very important. And Biden-Harris administration has expressed um, uh, support for rescinding that executive order that was recently done by President Trump to allow for those trainings, important trainings to continue. So Leela, thank you so much. And at this juncture, we are at the end of the formal portion of our presentation. Let me, before I hand it back over to Chloe and Anika for some of their additional questions and such, and any questions you've got, make sure to put them into the chat function. I think uh, Chloe is gonna monitor that for us. Let me, first of all, thank you all for your attention. And second, any of the issues that you've seen us discuss here today. We can go in so much deeper on and all these specific different fronts. Whatever we can address today in Q&A, let's do it. But if you're trying to reach us and find us down the road, there's our email addresses. You can find us through the Network for Public Health Law. Do let us know any questions that arise in your practice or in your experience or whatever ways you're trying to work and, and actually think through these critical sort of post-election 2020 issues. All right, now without further ado, we'll keep that up on screen for a second for our various different email addresses if you need them. Chloe, do we have questions, comments, anything that we should uh, address post our presentation? I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, yeah, so uh, one question we received was whether the slides will be made available. So they will be made available. Um, if you registered through the link prior to this, you should have a record of your email address and Onika or myself can send those out. Um, the next, look, the substantive question that I wanted to pose to you all sure. is, uh, in the wake of the surge of COVID cases and um, litigation that might arise from that, can you all give us a sense or maybe of what your thoughts or anticipation is on the um, climate for litigation coming from the misuse or the mis mishandling of exposure to COVID either by you know, cities, states, places that didn't have mask orders and that weren't implementing some of the best practices of the CDC or even employers who weren't implementing some of the best practices of the CDC? Gosh, Chloe, great question. And let me give a brief answer. I'll turn it over to Leela for her thoughts and comments as well, because we have been just looking at every issue like that over the last several months. We've been on top of that through the network. And some of the core things that we're starting to see is, first of all, we are on the cusp of I think a litigation explosion. And I don't mean to say that because of a change in presidential administrations. I mean, because we are literally crafting and finding various different approaches and ways in which different sort of novel legal arguments are starting to surface. Like what the Supreme Court dropped on us pre Thanksgiving at midnight, right before the holiday, it issues its decision in Cuomo, basically saying that religious enterprises now have some constitutional interest to avoid standardized provisions re, uh, relating to, you know, not allowing for aggregated settings in response to COVID-19. So in a 5-4 decision right before Thanksgiving, you saw the U.S. Supreme Court actually endorse 
and allow churches, synagogues, and other religious entities to express their First Amendment religious claims successfully for the purposes of shutting down some of those interventions. Chloe, here is a sheer result of what 2021 will bring. Two critical things. First, we will see COVID-19 in the rearview mirror at some point. It's not because vaccines will be instantly available and instantly successful and everybody can walk away. No, it won't work that easily, but it will start to diminish the overall impact. But the second thing you're gonna see, we're gonna start that process of hashing out legally through litigation designed to actually assess who's responsible, who's at fault, how are we gonna sort of parlay that into legal claims that really sort of grab either the court's attention at the highest level Supreme Court, or at state or local courts, where and how those claims might start to uh, surface beyond what we've already seen, which has been in a, a sort of number of different claims against employers and entities and governments that fail to do these things. I think it's 2021 is gonna be one of the most sensational years in legal jurisprudence ever in the United States because of the significant impacts of this specific condition on everybody in the US notably including African-Americans and others that have been directly and horrifically impacted far more extreme than some of the other Americans. Leela, any thoughts, comments to the sort of what might be the, the sort of novel or in ex, uh, explain, expanding litigation theories that may come up in 2021? Go ahead. Yeah, I think we've, you know, as, you know, as mentioned the Cuomo case that we just saw last week, um, there was a case, I believe in Florida, um, but I can't recall exactly, uh, but a case of a family, um, you know, I, I, of a family of a grocery store employee who had sued the um, employer. So, you know, Chloe, you had mentioned employer lawsuits. I think we might see more of those where the argument was that the um, establishment had not um, uh, established a mass mandate to protect the um, employees. So I think we will see, and that's a brand new case, so we don't, obviously don't know how that will be decided, but I think we will see maybe similar cases like that come forward where families of um, those that have been impacted by COVID or that, you know, unfortunately passed away after, you know, becoming infected, they might be um, bringing lawsuits like that. So I think we might see more of those. And, you know, one additional thought, and I'd love to get more feedback from the Young Lawyers Division at NBA on this specific theme, because I see it coming to a courtroom near you, but I don't know exactly know how it's gonna be framed or how successful it will be. And actually, it may actually be surfacing already in places like Atlanta or other places. And that question is, you know, with a, with a pandemic that is clearly revealed as per Lita's themes on health justice, you know, just gross inequities, if I've described them, in response to specific vulnerable populations. And to be sure, Black Americans and others at the top of that list, uh, Native Americans and others too, but you know, it's the same pandemic, but the impact on specific populations has been profoundly worse. And to that end, that falls on government. How are you solving that? How well are you solving that? And is your failure to solve it, or at least address it straight on, does that generate something to the tune of an equal protection or other argument that could be quite interesting, involving potential long-term repercussions? I haven't seen it surface yet, but I'd love to see the legal innovations that underlie that type of government failure to actually systematically address known impacts at that level that impacts so many millions of Americans for no reason other than their position or their situation that's been failed to be addressed through various different known interventions. We shall see what surfaces, but Chloe, that sort of litigation, all those themes and so many more, 2021 is gonna be an incredible year for that, I would dare say. I believe uh, Chair Williams has a question next. Please. Hi, good evening. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, you saw in the chat that one of our national past presidents is here, uh, Benita Banks. So thank you, President Banks, for joining us. Um, she's, she has previously served as our um, COVID-19 task force co-chair last year. So this is, this is something that we are definitely interested in. Um, I was wondering, now that there are several COVID-19 vaccinations that are on the horizon, and I know the CDC panel met today um, to figure out the order of distribution, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, with healthcare and, and everything going on with it, do we know if those vaccinations when made to the general public, is that going to be, um, 
free of charge? Like, will you need insurance to, to access it? I would think in a pandemic, it, it would be accessible to everyone. You would think, Anika, and I want to see that outcome. So in just a second, I'll turn it over to Leela. She was actually on and listening in a little bit on the CDC Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices call today. And she'll give you a little report of what they recommended. It's going to be pretty consistent with some comments I'll make here now. But let me be sure what I've done in regards to some of the work on our national front with the national academies, when they produce their sort of ethical allocation framework for vaccines, they made several core recommendations. Anika, you'll like one of them every vaccine and every American that gets it, gets it for free. This is not about who can pay for what and when and how, you know, how quickly you can haul off to Walgreens and pay the 50 or $100 charge. The National Academies wants it to be for free. And I think even the Trump administration wants it to be for free. They funded billions of dollars to the pharmaceutical companies to actually make and produce these vaccines. And I think they're expecting to be able to distribute them for free. Uh, I believe the real interesting issues will come up when they're, when we simply see vaccines start to arrive in sufficient batches for states to distribute, and we start to assess, well, who actually in a particular jurisdiction gets front of the line? It may not go like clockwork, Onika, to be sure. In other words, states may or may not follow CDC guidance on this. It's going to be very interesting to see. They certainly don't seem to be following the National Academy's guidance. And whether a state would have the audacity to actually attempt to charge on some of these vaccines or whether somebody can get front of the line if they pay a charge, oh, that's going to be fascinating. It is not part of the plan, but in this environment, hopefully in a post-Trump administration and Biden administration, we won't even see this question arise, but it's a concern for us for sure. Leila, I know you were tapping into the ACIP meeting. Anything to report from there? Sure, yeah. The CDC's ACIP, which is the advisory um Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't remember if it's committee or council. Everybody has an acronym at this <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> uh, but um, they, you know, they, they did meet today. Um, I, I saw on um, one of the major news outlets breaking news. You know, they're meeting. So I think it was on the forefront of many people's minds that they were meeting today and discussing. You know what certain aspects would be in phases. And phase 1A, so not even just phase one, but phase 1A will be um, for healthcare providers and um, long-term care um, facility residents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was um, decided today. So looking at now going forward, we know that there will not be an abundance of vaccine available in the at the beginning, you know that it's just not possible that everybody who wants it right away is going to have access to it. So that's why these um, groups are meeting to decide how to um, equitably allocate them, who should get priority, and a lot of the local and states are also looking at this and developing their plans and deciding and. Because of these issues, we're actually at the network going to be doing a webinar on this December 10th. Mm -hmm. If you go to our website, it will be um, publicized later this week. It's a late breaking um, topic, we know. So it's, uh, you know, a, a new uh, webinar that we're putting together because we want to be able to address these issues we know people have questions on. Um, so it should be up on our website later this week. And um, some of these key components of allocation plans and challenges that some local um, health officials are facing right now will be will be looked at. Great point, Leela. Thank you. I think additional questions have arisen. Chloe, uh, what else are you saying? Uh, so we have two more vaccine uh, vaccine related questions. Uh, so from past President Banks, she asked, "What data should communities seek to feel comfortable with taking the vaccine?" While the vaccine is effective, what about adverse or side effects and long-term effects as well? Great question in regards to those specific assessments. And it's just an honor to have you join us today. So I'm really pleased that we can get some of this good information across with your presence. So to that end, however, let me assure you, based on every piece of intel that we get access to, and we get you know a lot through our various different connections, this vaccine, or I should say, these vaccines. This is not a one fit all type of environment. We'll see multiple vaccines, I think, I dare say approved by FDA or authorized that is for limited purposes and limited groups, but they will be extremely closely monitored. CDC's promising that. 
The National Academies mandated it as far as we must be able to monitor for adverse events and for efficacy, for how effective it actually is, not just among the 30,000 or so that you know underwent the trial, the 300,000, the 3 million, the 30 million that will actually start to take it across the United States and globally in specific populations. Yes, it will be closely monitored, but you're really asking a great question, especially among populations that might be tentative or you know, really questioning whether the vaccine's right for them or whether the timing's right for them. What do you need to see in regards to those adverse event data? You want to see no adverse events. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's just no vaccine we can produce on virtually anywhere on any specific condition that has no adverse impact for no one within the population. We just don't know where quite to project that to be, but at the moment, I will assure you at least from FDA policy on this, which seems to be as divorced from the Trump administration's push as possible. They will not authorize that vaccine unless they feel like, obviously, the immense public benefits of access to the vaccine far outweigh uh, any potential adverse Im impacts that they can measure appropriately within the populations. But you're right to ask it because honestly, the first moment we see an adverse event that's serious for one of the vaccines, it will Americans will think it applies to all of them. That'll be a problem. And the second issue is, if those adverse events do for some reason fall on a specific population, uh, Blacks or Asians or Native Americans or others or such, that's just gonna be disastrous, we know that. And so they're really watching very carefully for all those impacts. I would be looking early and often for just how far and what sort of data from a Biden administration will be publicly out there because it will be quite clear and quite transparent, I would dare say. Leela, anything you'd add to that quick remark? No, I think, um, you know, honestly, more will come out when um, the FDA considers the, you know, the EUAs um, December 10th for, I believe, the Pfizer one, and then the week after for the Moderna vaccine. Mm -hmm. Some of that, you know, some of the data we've seen have been from the um, vaccine manufacturers, you know, revealed that what they've revealed publicly. And so I think when the FDA is evaluating it, we will see more, their experts will, you know, go over that immensely. And I think we'll learn more at that point as well. Great point, Leela. Chloe, what else you see, questions wise? So another question that, that I wanted to pose is, you know, we kind of talked about um, the importance of the police powers, right? So of the government during, in, in public health and policy. So with that, with the understanding of the government's police powers, can the government mandate that anyone take the vaccine and, and you know as a follow-up to that mm -hmm. what about employers may an employer mandate that an employee receive the vaccine in order to return to work oh chloe you're all over it i mean honestly why do you have to ask the toughest questions both are excellent <laughs> let me address the first uh, i'm sorry the second part and leela i'll turn it over to you for what you feel on the police powers and or prince patriot powers questions employer mandates at the top of the screen, you're seeing the mention of our great colleague, Jen Pyatt, and Jen will be joining Leela on that December 10th vaccination uh, webinar. It'd be a really great session. Jen and I were just looking at this issue though in a separate memo. We'd be happy to make it available. Uh, it's on our website at the network right now, but Chloe, I'll try to send you the link and make sure you've got it. It's on vaccination mandates for COVID. Can an employer mandate the vaccine, especially this type of employer, healthcare entities, right? the very same entities that will be hosting all the people we've lined up and said straight up, you're first in line for a vaccine. <laughs> well, we kind of expect you to get it. Many healthcare entities might actually impose a mandate if they're private sector hospitals, private sector clinics, they can do it. And legally, they can get away with it. And they can do it because gosh, against the backdrop of what you need for the purposes of assuring a safe an hospitable environment for patients, for persons visiting hospitals, for all the other persons within the hospital, healthcare workers and otherwise, who aren't treating COVID patients but could be exposed through healthcare workers, you will likely see enough legal support for a mandate among private sector employees, uh, or employers that is, to basically say either get vaccinated with the COVID vaccine or don't come to work. Now, mind you, that's tough but we've done it before with influenza vaccine and other issues like tuberculosis vaccine. When I was at Johns Hopkins, we required it in that hospital setting too. Chloe, I expect it, I really do. I think actually you'll see lawyers and others representing hospitals all but say, hey, the vaccine works, 
we've got to use it. We, we have to expect it among our employees. Leela, what about when it's public sector, government saying, hey, adults get vaccinated? You think they can pull it off, Leela? Well, there's only five minutes left, and I could probably go on on this for quite a while. Uh, yeah. But if you want to read a case that really, you know, a, a seminal case in public health law that dates back um, to, you know, the turn of the century, uh, Jacobson v. Massachusetts, that recognize the state's police powers and their authorities. Um, but in terms of uh, the public sector, I, you know, we in our country do require vaccines for children as a requirement for entrance to school. So, you know, other countries have different ties of when they kind of monitor vaccines. We do it at school entrance. That's kind of our entry point of how we require vaccines is you're going to, uh, you know, kindergarten, you have to have certain vaccines before you can be in a classroom. And um, I, you know, so the states do regulate vaccines already and, and state law is, you know, or vaccination laws are done by state of what's required when different states have different exemptions. California um, is one state that recently um, uh, changed their laws to only allow for medical exemptions. They don't allow now for non-medical exemptions. And so there's, you know, different laws in different states, but I, I don't see, um, I don't see states implementing a requirement in any recent times to change it for, you know, students or kids for the vaccine now. You know, that might change years from now where, you know, just like they require the MMR vaccine. That may change down the line. I don't see them using their police powers to do it at this time. Um, I think if we do see it, I think we'll see more of what was mentioned for, you know, healthcare employees or certain private employers. Um, but I don't see the state using their powers right now. I think, um, I think that you know, uh, many in individuals um, we've seen already in certain polls have fear against the vaccine and are concerned. And I think education and educating those individuals about vaccine would be um, the first step rather, that states would do rather than, than mandating it. Great point, Leela. Chloe, Onika, thank you so much. We'll turn it back over to you for final comments. Well, I think I'll turn it over to Onika to close this out um, as the current chair. So um, I would just like to acknowledge Chair-elect Chloe Woods um, this is completely her, her doing. So thank you so much. Um, it's a very timely topic, especially for our community and everything that's going on with the changing of administrations and the new vaccines. Every, every day something, something is um, happening. So thank you so much um, for joining us today, Professor Hodge and Professor Barraza. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Uh, we have some upcoming events if you would like to join us. Uh, tomorrow, we uh, will be speaking with uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, and on next Wednesday, we will be having hashtag hot cocoa and chill, which will be um, just a social event. Please stay tuned for additional events, and we will be sending out these slides and the recording um, in a follow-up email. And thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Our pleasure, Nika. Thank you all. Enjoy the holidays upcoming. Take care. Thank you.